Hello, and welcome to episode two of the Shared Practices podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Richard Lowe. Thank you to everyone who's reached out to me in the last 24 hours since episode one launched. I've had multiple people say, this this is exactly what I need, or I, I needed this six months ago. There was uh, a couple of graduates from my same dental school who just opened their practice straight out of dental school. And he sent me a Facebook message saying, basically, this has been the most stressful two months of my life of dealing with lawyers, CPAs, consultants, brokers, bankers, getting financing, closing on everything, moving into the practice, setting up systems. <laughs> he said, if there had been a podcast like yours during this journey, we would have had far less stressful and sleepless nights. Um, and then he and then he turned around and said, if there's anything that we could add a value to your podcast, let us know. And I've had multiple people who've come out and said this, that this is what I wanted or what I need and, and what I want for the future for myself. How can I help? And, and that blows me away. Thank you guys so much. One super easy thing you could do if you have a moment right now, go into your app, whatever you're using to listen to this and leave us a review on iTunes. It only takes a minute, but uh, I would love to end up in the new and noteworthy section of iTunes uh, which is just kind of an area where they display some new podcasts that are getting some traction and are getting good reviews. And the reviews and downloads that we get in the first uh, weeks really determine who ends up in that new and noteworthy section. So it means a ton always, but especially right now, if you're listening to this and it's, and it's coming out fresh, uh, if you could go leave us a review. You can also share the podcast with your friends Sometimes uh, some people aren't familiar with podcasts. And so they're like, ah, what, what the heck is a podcast? And why would I want to listen to a dental podcast? So what you do in those cases is you grab their phone, you open the podcast app, and, and you download it for them and say, here, this is easy, push play, and you can listen to this podcast. Uh, that would mean a lot to me. So whether you share it on Facebook or, or share it with someone who you think would, would really appreciate it or leave a review on iTunes, uh, that... Uh, that's a small way you could, you know, pay back. That'd be great. That'd be awesome. In in season one of this podcast, we're trying to address the issues that someone coming straight out of dental school cares about. So finding a job, um, deciding if if ownership is for them. And that's, that's a question that we're going to hit a little harder towards the end of this week. Um, expanding their scope of practice through through CE and, and learning confidence and speed. Um, negotiating all of these kind of early years of AEGDs and GPRs and is this worth it or that worth it and how should I use my time and, and where should I go? That's that's going to be season one. And then also, you know, student loans, that's another big part I forgot uh, that people tend to care about and are stressed about. So if there's anything that you're stressed about as a new dentist, please let me know so we can make episodes about that. That's That's the goal. Um, ultimately, we want to talk about practice ownership, but you can't get there if you don't navigate these first few years. And if you know where you're going, maybe you can navigate a little faster. And that's the goal. In today's episode, we interview someone who knew where he was going, and that is Dr. Derek Williams. And some of you might recognize him from Dentaltown because he created a, a group on Dentaltown called Ambitious Dental Students. And I think he did it. I can't. I, I want to say that he did it his second year of of dental school, and that group and his initiative. And he basically he went and he would like contact Scott Luna, like we heard from yesterday, and uh, Graham Dursley, and all these other people that he really respected from their con- contributions on Dental Town, and invited them to this little group where he had other dental students that were like minded. And this was you know, three years ago, and now he he's graduated. And he's moved straight from graduation into practice ownership. And so today's episode is all about his journey. And I really struggled to cut this episode down because I was just going to get, I wanted to capture this moment of being a new owner. He's only been in the practice right now, it was four weeks. But when I interviewed him, it was only two weeks. And so everything was fresh. All of the stress, all of the little ups and downs and, and the bumps we're all fresh. And I wanted to capture the good and the bad. And, and he made the point to me after we stopped recording, and he wanted to make sure that I that I shared that, 
that he does not recommend this for everyone. This is not a, a example that everyone should be held up to the standard of, of, of buying a practice straight out of school or, or doing a startup straight out of school. So th- this interview ended up being an hour and a half and, and I couldn't, I couldn't cut anything. It was all good. It was it was either specific steps that he took and the barriers that he had to overcome to get to practice ownership or this experience of being a new owner and a new dentist all at the same time. And, and I, I just I loved the whole interview. So if you think an hour and a half is too long, there's a function on your app, whatever app you're listening to, you should be able to hit the little speed button. It'll be like a one X in the corner. If you tap on that, you can bump it up. A lot of times you can go to 1.25x. That's that's great if you're not used to listening to things at a little faster speed. I like to bump it up to one and a half to two. That's kind of my sweet spot. Rarely will I go past two, two and a half, maybe three X. Um, and depending on the app and how good it is at compressing it and everything, you can listen to an hour and a half of audio in an hour if you're at one and a half X and the, the apps make it sound so good. It doesn't sound like a chipmunk talking. It doesn't sound weird. Somehow they just delete little seconds of, of audio. So, so it's magically transformed into this compressed feature. So if you're trying to fit more audio into your life, it's a great, great little hack, great little trick. Um, the other time, the only time you don't want to do that is if you're on a long road trip and you have a really good audiobook. Like I was listening to the Martian from Phoenix to Texas, all by myself in the car. And the book was so good. And I had it on 2x. And it was like a, it was only like an 11 hour audiobook. But by the time it was done, I was only five hours into my 15 hour drive. And I was like, why did I put that on 2x? So that that would be the only warning. Otherwise, just just crank it up a bit, you're going to enjoy it. Lastly, at the break, we're going to share a little tidbit that's going to make you maybe not like your loops so much. Kind of like when someone points out, oh, your face isn't symmetrical and you never noticed that before. So I'm going to point out something about your loops that maybe you didn't notice before and you might not like me for it. So without further ado, here is Dr. Derek Williams. Awesome. We have with us today, Dr. Derek Williams. Is it is it a little weird for you to, to hear Dr. Derek Williams? Like, is that still new to you? It is. It is still new. So when, it's strange to hear. I'm getting more used to it. But well, now now that you've had a couple of weeks under your belt, you know, and people all day long are are calling you that, it, it kind of you know you settle into it. Uh, yeah. When did you graduate? Um, it was uh, May May 23rd. So it's been. So we're at like August 6th right now when we're recording. So it's been you know a few months. Yeah. Yeah. And um, for our listeners, um. Describe your current work situation, and and uh, we'll we'll go into kind of how you got there. But but where are you right now, and what are you doing right now? Sure, um, I'm in I'm in Lufkin, Texas, and I just purchased a prax- practice uh, two and a half weeks ago. So I just finished my my second uh, week seeing patients in the practice. So, and I think that's crazy because. Your second week seeing patients was also your second week of practice ownership. You you did what I would say maybe one or two out of every dental class does, maybe a few more, but just jump straight into practice ownership, uh, which is awesome um, and also super scary and super stressful. So uh, I, I wanted to interview you because you kind of have a unique journey and you're right in the heart of it. And I think a lot of times... Um, once a dentist is established and things are rolling a lot more smoothly, they kind of forget all of the little ups and downs and bumps that, that happened yeah. along the way. So I kind of wanted to capture your journey. And maybe we can start with, um, you know, so you graduated in May and it's August 6th um, and you've you've purchased a practice. You didn't do a, a scratch startup. Um, and we'll go into maybe kind of more about why you did that and and, and why um, you didn't do a startup and why, you know, you went straight into practice later. But I wanted to hear just that journey of graduation, finding a practice, buying a practice. How did that all go and, and what what held you up and prevented you from from maybe purchasing as soon as you would have liked or, or you know, kind of bumps along the way? Yeah, so um, the last several years in dental school, I've been thinking hard about what I wanted to do. And I can talk another time about kind of how 
because I've kind of had different paths and different ideas of how I wanted to get where I wanted to go. Sure. Um, and it's, and it's changed. Um, but basically once I decided that I wanted to find well, a practice, to, and I, I, I'm going to, I want to go back to that because I think like when we're at this stage of thinking we know what we want, but not really knowing how to get there or what, what to do, you know, like we're figuring things out. We think we know, Oh, I'll just do this, this, and this. And then every step along the way, you realize you have to change your, your direct, your trajectory, your direction, what your, what your plan is. I don't think that's insignificant. I think people, um, if they get hooked on one plan and they're not flexible and willing to pivot when something new comes along, I think that can be an impediment in, in getting to practice ownership or, or where they want to be eventually. So it's, it sounds like you've done a lot of pivoting. Yeah. And I totally agree. The, all, all the successful people that I know, um, they take advantage of opportunities that, um, come in front of them. And so they're always, they're always looking for ways to change and adapt. And, and I think that's what allows very successful people to be successful is that they're, they're looking for those opportunities and that they're, they never, they never settle for right where they're at. They're, they're willing to change and adapt. So how did you stumble upon this opportunity, this, this practice that you ended up purchasing? So once I, once I decided to purchase a practice, um, I, uh, there were certain criteria that I were, that I was looking for. And, uh, Hunter Smith is a dentist that I got to know on dental town. He's in Jonesboro, Arkansas. And he's a stud. Yeah, he is. He is. He's a, he's a good guy. Um, but so how many, how many practices is he up to? He's like two years out and he owns like five practices. Yeah, I think they just purchased their six. That's crazy. So he's he's got a partner, but yeah, together I think they they own six. Um, I hope uh, to get him on the show, but okay, keep going. Yeah. So, um, anyway, so another thing we can get into, I don't know today or another time, but I started a private group on Dental Town called yep. the Ambitious Dental Students, and um, I uh, once in a while I'll invite people that I I like what they're saying to kind of join our group and to kind of teach us something about what they sure what they know or they've become an expert in which is and awesome so after, yeah so after I after I uh, started reading some stuff that Hunter was talking about he was really deep into um, evaluating practices and looking at opportunities and 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 judging them based on not just anyone but based on your situation and how valuable is this practice to you specifically. Okay. And um, so invited him to the group and we had, I mean, we got a really cool thread and just talk about the ins and outs of everything. And uh, that's part of what helped me. Uh, I mean, actually it's the biggest part of, of what helped me decide what kind of a practice I was looking for, what the criteria were. So what, um, what resonated with you and what, um, what did you realize from that interaction with Hunter that, um, you wouldn't have realized, or maybe that you weren't looking at before that? Right. Um, so before that, and when, when I first started kind of talking to Hunter, I was looking at, uh, purchasing practices. I was in, I went to dental school at Creighton in Omaha, Nebraska. And okay. so I was, uh, my wife and I liked the area. We were thinking about staying there. So I, I ran some demographics there and started looking at, um, purchases to practice. So I started reaching out to different dentists and getting to know some and looking at their practice and, and seeing what they had. Um, so and none of them, I was going to say, how did that go? Did, did anyone like blow you off or get kind of rude or, you know, how, how did that interaction go? Like, how did you reach out to them? And yeah, tell me about that. Um, so I listened to a podcast with, uh, Mark Costas and Brady Frank. I yep. think it was actually Mark, Mark's first episode. Yep. And Brady talked about how it's a great episode. He, I'll, I'll have a link to that in the show notes then. Yeah. Yeah. He, Brady talked about how he interviewed like 70 dentists during dental school and, um, he basically, he got offers, but he didn't, he didn't say in the interview, but I, I found out when I talked to Brady that he asked the dentists if they would be willing to sell their practice to him. Okay. Cause in the interview, so, he said that he like asked what their exit strategy was, but yeah. he, he didn't come out and say that he actually was asking all of them, um, 
if they would sell it to him. So that's that's good to know. Okay. Right. So I kind of tried to approach things with his same way. I basically would I would just call up the dental office and I'd say, "Hey, I'm a dental student in the area. I'm trying to I'm thinking about sticking around this area. I'd love to talk to Dr. so and so and just ask a few questions and so um almost all of them responded. Okay. Uh some of them were interested in my motives and uh there was pretty much everybody was friendly. Okay, cool. Uh, there was one guy that wasn't super happy that to talk to me, but oh, sure. Um, I mean, several invited me to go to lunch or to dinner with them, and actually, um, <laughs> those ones didn't even want to uh, sell their practice, but they were just super friendly, super nice guys. Well, and now yeah. you now you have relationships with those guys. I think um, uh, I'm I'm going to talk about this book on the podcast called Never Eat Alone. Um, and, and I don't know if you've ever read it or heard of it, but it's basically this idea that networking is not handing out business cards. It's this idea that if you reach out to people and make real relationships with people and go out to lunch and go out to dinner, invite people over. And, you know, when you go to a conference, you find people to interact with and, and, um, there's no, there's no way you can lose doing that. Um, and those relationships are going to be real relationships and friendships. And I think as a dental student, you have this like unique angle of I'm a, I'm harmless. Like I need help and not, not, not that you're coming out and like begging for help, but you're just like, you're reaching out and saying, you know, I'm at the beginning of my career. What, what, you know, has helped you and, and seeking advice. I think a lot of dentists, are into helping people. And so when they see that and they see, oh, wow, I've made all these other mistakes, I, I, you know, I would love it if you didn't have to make those same mistakes or, you know, here's what's worked for me. And, and they're willing to open up, I feel like, to dental students and be very honest and genuine with dental students. Uh, whereas maybe once you're in private practice and you've been established for a while, it becomes more of a, not bragging, but, you know, they're just not as open and genuine um, as, as they are. So I think it's really cool that you took advantage of that and you just reached out and to see what happens. Okay. So, okay. So here's where we were. So I found some practices. Um, and I, one of them I found was really cheap. It it was, it was like 40,000 bucks and it only had, um, two operatories, but he worked out two operatories. Okay. And he had, his his personal office was in a room that he said was plumbed and could be turned into a third operatory. Okay. So um, I started considering that, and his his collections was I don't know somewhere around like one hundred and twenty thousand a year. I mean, uh. his, he, he and his wife were just um, he, he he only worked with he and his wife, so his wife okay. run, would run the the front, front and then assist and stuff. So mm. I thought I thought maybe I could just have this as like a really a really cheap startup and Ugh. um and and grow and try and do different things and so i was and then i saw a couple other opportunities but um not i don't know they just were not really well performing practices but i saw them as possibly having an opportunity i reached out to hunter and started to talk to him and he he kind of just gave me this different mindset that he said, you need to be willing to go more in debt and to purchase the highest, highest producing practice that you can afford to right. purchase that still has a huge potential upside. Okay. So that's when I started looking for practices um, that I that I could purchase for in between three and five hundred thousand. I wanted to find something that I felt like I could I could um do everything that the previous doc was doing and then add right. some pr- procedures to the practice so that, it, um, I mean, and, and it's, it's hard coming out of dental school cause you don't know how much you're going to be able to produce per month. <laughs> that's, that's um, the plunge, the, the, the leap of faith. So that's, yeah. But the scary part about that is that that extra debt, you have to go into more debt. And what, do you mind me asking what your student loans were before adding on any extra debt? No. Um, so my student loans upon graduation with accumulated interest were about two ninety. Okay, so um, not not awful. I mean, I'm I'm coming from Midwestern private school land, so you know everything's over four hundred thousand there. So two ninety right. sounds great to me, but I'm sure it doesn't feel yeah. feel great to you. 
No, I mean, I realize it's, it's somewhere about average. I mean, I did, I did what I could to try and cut back on expenses sure. and make money on the side and to, to not have a ton of debt, but obviously it's uh, just something that you got to do if you want to go down this road as a dentist. So, and, and, and I think that's awesome. I feel like way too many of the previous generations of dentists and, and people on dental town and people doing podcasts, there's this sense of like, Oh, you guys have so much debt. That's awful. I wouldn't do that. You know, and you're like, okay, well, give me something helpful. Don't, don't tell me right. that, that my life is over. <laughs> like, so that's one of my goals on this podcast is to find people who can face the fact of here is my debt. I'm not going to go crazy and just continue to go in debt, but it is what it is. And I'm not going to let my student loans hold me back from propelling my career forward. Um, yeah. And, and that's huge. So how debt adverse are you? Did your student loans keep you up at night? You know, there's some people that are like, ah, they're just student loans, like whatever, it's play money. And then there are other people that think about it all the time and it weighs on their mind of, I have to get rid of these student loans. I have to, uh, you know, uh, what, am, what have I done? You know, all of these thoughts of doubt and, and frustration, kind of where were you on that spectrum? I tend to be a person that I worry about things that I can control. Okay. Um, and so when it comes to debt, there are, I mean, there's only so much that I could control with, with managing my student debt. And so I would, I would try and, I mean, my wife and I had a budget. Um, sure. I would try and make money on the side when I could, but I didn't, I didn't stress about loans besides that, because I mean, what, what good is that going to do good. me yeah, to, yeah. to be worried more about it? Absolutely. So, and I, I've felt and when it comes to uh, considering loans to purchase a practice, I mostly just look at the potential upside. Right. And I look at the advantages of owning a practice and, and growing it um, versus uh, just being an associate and trying to stay low debt. I mean, I've, there's the thing that's so cool about uh, financial strategies is that there's not one right way. There's so many different ways that you can do it. I mean, you look at it. Um, Doug Carlson right. and Mr. Money Mustache and uh, White Coat Investor. I kind of put those people in a sim somewhat similar category because it's it's about Frugality. staying out of debt and living living more simply. And, I, I would say they're um, they're like a Dave Ramsey plus. They're like yeah, an intelligent four doctors, four dentists. Um, yeah. Dave Ramsey with with a little bit more practicality. I I was like drinking the Dave Ramsey Kool Aid and doing everything I could to have like zero extra debt and you know not wanting to buy a big practice. That was my thought and trying to pay down my remaining student loans before I got out of the army. And now just talking with uh, four or five different people for this podcast, like my mindset my my mindset has completely shifted where. I, I'm going to keep my student loans through the rest of the army. I'm not going to pay them off because I need the liquidity that would yeah. have disappeared if I had thrown those at those student loans. Um, and, right. I, and I did that when I graduated dental school. I, I sold a house and threw a whole bunch of money from the, the sale of our home at student loans. And I realized that was the wrong, that was the wrong choice um, if I want to go into practice ownership. So anyways, once again, talking about me too much. So how did you find this practice? Um, so... Basically, once I kind of had those criteria, I started talk. I started reaching out to um, brokers and just uh, basically any way I could find different practices and look at their financials and location and just kind of trying to evaluate everything about a practice and, and rank it in, in different ways. So you spread um, your search out from just Nebraska, Omaha area. Now you're looking more places than just that? Yeah. So I started looking... I was looking um, Arizona, I was looking Nebraska, Iowa, um, Texas, uh, New Mexico, um, Oklahoma. So I was I was looking in all over. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, was, I was looking in several different states. Kind of Southwest area. Right. OK, cool. Um, and was that kind of nerve wracking with licensing? Because I feel like you know, at least now with NERB and REB, and it's it's easier, much easier than it was before to cross state lines and get dental licenses in different places. But was that 
something that um, was kind of mentally like, oh, if I go here, then I'm gonna have to get a license with these people? Or is that like, okay, it's just, it is what it is? Um, no, I, well, yeah. So I thought when I signed up for boards, I thought I was going to be in Nebraska or Iowa, that area. And so okay. I signed up for uh, credits for Central. And um, anyway, so then later when I started expanding and looking at other states, I had to kind of find out what other states accepted accepted credits. And um, so Texas was one of them. So it opened up all of Texas for me. In retrospect, if I was doing what you were doing, I might have considered doing like both credits and reb. Do you wish you had done that or not really? Um, it, uh, it would, there's, there's a couple of states that would have been nice. Um, I started looking at Nevada and then I realized that Nevada doesn't accept central. So that was kind of out of, I, I wasn't, that wasn't really an option for me at that point. So, right. um, I don't know. I just hated Oh, it's so awful. And the stress of fighting patients oh, and it's, stuff. It's so. the worst. And then it's the worst, the fact that you're now like narrowing your options. And, and it's like when you're in your situation where you are just graduating and you don't have a history of production and banks aren't banging down the door to lend you money, yeah. having all the options possible is is ideal. And so uh, that, I, I, I would hate to recommend that to someone. But if if you're really ambitious about finding the best opportunity and having the best practice and you don't want location to hold you back, that might be something to consider is, is to take both. But stomaching two yeah. of those exams on top of senior year and everything else is just ugh, awful. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. so you're looking, um, you're, you're working with a broker at this point. How did you decide who to work with? Um, I didn't, I didn't necessarily decide on them. A certain broker or you're just reaching was, out to brokers who had practices yeah okay yeah and so basically basically the process would go like this i would find a practice online somewhere i would send an email to the broker and, telling my situation and where were you searching sorry um i was looking on craigslist i was looking on dental town okay um and usually usually when you find a practice you know, certain practices in different areas, you kind of get to know the brokers that are in the different areas. And then at that point, when I, I was mostly, I was going to the brokers websites and okay. looking at practices that way. So once um, you, you looked on these other sources, then you realize, okay, I, I can go straight to the source and the brokers are going to have the practices listed on their place. Right. Okay. Um, so you contact the broker and the, a lot of them wanted to talk to me and some just said, uh, you're crazy. This isn't going to work. There's going to be, <laughs> there's going to be plenty of other buyers that are, they didn't want to waste their time with you. you. Right. So with, which, which is, is understandable because yeah, you're right. <laughs> Banks don't want to lend. And so as a, from a broker's point of view, uh, look, talking to a dental student or someone that's going to graduate soon is, is a high risk to their plan. I mean, right. they could fall through and they wasted tons of time and the seller's frustrated. So would they even give you the numbers? So like you have to contact them to get the financials of the practice. Is that right? Yeah. So they, they would just have me sign a non-disclosure agreement and then, uh, and then they would be able to send the financials to me. And would they, these guys that found out they were, you were a dental student, was that after they'd sent you the financials or before that? No, I basically would contact them and most of them wanted to talk on the phone um, but I was upfront with all of them. I told all of them that I was a dental student when I first messaged them or, okay. or talked okay. to them because I didn't, I didn't want it to become an issue later. I later. wanted people to know up front and so that it is what it is. No, and yeah. You can decide if you want to. And, and if they don't want to waste their time with a dental student, quote unquote, you know, in their mind, then you right. don't want to waste your time with them because it's not going anywhere. Right. So that makes sense. Right. Um, okay. So you're reaching out. And then how did you stumble upon this practice? Just kind of through through looking at these different brokers' websites, you came across this one? Yeah, so I found, so, okay, so someone I should mention too is um, there's a dental student at Midwestern. He's just starting his third year, George Hariri. And him and I have kind of become friends through Dental Town and uh, talk about different opportunities together and evaluate George, situations. George is a stud. Yeah, he's like, a, and he's a spreadsheet master. Mm. So he was, um, 
he he basically created uh, spreadsheets where um, I could evaluate a practice. I could punch in the numbers, and it would kind of I could fairly quickly be able to evaluate how well something was doing and what potential upsides were and different things. That's awesome. Um, so anyway, I probably looked at I'm guessing 50 to 60 practices from different people looking at um, financials and different things and. There was, I was, there's a broker that is in East Texas. I guess he's all over Texas, but, um, his name is Rich Nicely. Okay. Uh, the website is TX dash or hyphen PT. I think it's Texas. It stands for Texas practice transitions. I okay. Um, and, uh, so I had found another, uh, a practice that I liked and was talking to him and that one was in, uh, Tyler, Texas, which is about an hour away from where I'm at now. And so and you were looking, I, I, I'm going to step back on you here. Um, you were looking for this kind of three to $500 range, $500,000 range. Um, that you felt like you could meet that production, you know, not knowing because you're new and you haven't been an associate anywhere. Um, and what else were you looking at to eliminate practices versus stuff that you wanted? You know, like what were the criteria that was coming out of this spreadsheet that allow you to, to put something aside versus become a little bit more interested? Um, so I would look at what percentage of the total production was coming from hygiene. Okay. Um, if they had, if they had somewhere around like 20% coming from hygiene, then that means that the dentist is maximizing the, the work that's coming out of those patients. If you, or if you see uh, um, hygiene that's around 25 to 30 percent, or even higher, then uh, there could be different things going on. But, sure. Um, Maybe one practice just has a more robust, you know, hygiene, right. and they're doing more SRP and things like that, versus another right. practice who's just profies and exams. Sure. Yeah. But in general, so look- use that as an indicator of like untapped production and potential. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. And then I was also looking at. Um, I would just look at, I would, I would look at the location that the practice was in. I'd just look on Google maps and be able to tell what kind of an area was and how visible it was. Um, just look at what procedures the doc was doing and what he's, what he's referring out. Um, I would get the procedure code list, okay. and, which would tell the number of, the, of the different procedures that had been done in the last year. Right. Um, and that can kind of tell me a little bit about how the how the dentist practices. And if they're doing uh, a bunch of ortho or or something else that you're not doing, then that's kind of things that you're maybe staying away from versus right. be- bread and butter dentistry, a lot of amalgams. You're like, okay, we, we got some yep. things that we can do here. Exactly. Okay, cool. So now you've reached out with, with this broker and, and there was another practice you were interested in. It sounds like he was willing to actually talk with you and, and then... Did he bring this one to you or did you find this on his website? So I, I, yeah. So he was one of the few brokers that was, that was really open. And he said, yeah, I don't, I don't have a problem. He said, I've sold several practices to guys right out of school. And that was really encouraging to me. And he gave me, he gave me a list of clients that he had helped. And I, I reached out to them and talked to them and tried to kind of just understand what they went through, what their experience was. So yeah, so I talked to those people, and then I kind of moved forward with this broker. That one of the practices, he said, was probably – it was too early for my timeline. And I kept hearing that from a lot of brokers, that if I graduated in May and then got my license a month or so later, that um, if I'm you know, if I'm talking to them in February, they're saying, well, this practice is probably going to be gone by the time that you're even mm. – even able to, to be there. So I spent a lot of time looking at practices that I probably couldn't even have the chance to purchase, but it it gave me somewhat experience to know what to look for in different things. Well, and that's like, I don't know if I'm, I'm a big Craigslister and whenever I'm, I'm going to buy something used on Craigslist, um, I'll get on there and I'll just kind of watch the prices for a little while. If it's a bigger item, um, and get familiar with with like what oh, is yeah. the going price of things, and then yeah. once something pops up that's a good deal, you you recognize it instantly. You're like, ooh, my gut tells right. me like for what they're posting this, this is a really good deal. Um, 
And, and I had this experience looking for a house to rent because we were trying to save some money and, and looking at, at switching to something with a little lower. Actually, I found a place with a higher square footage and $200 less a month that we were looking at moving into. And um, the timing has to line up. If you're looking at buying renting a place and it's six months out, well, you're, you're wasting your time, but maybe you're getting an idea of what the market is worth. So that was good that you recognized, oh, even though I'm, I can't buy these, I now have a the skill of evaluating things and deciding, do I want this or not? And then once that actual deal pops up and the timing lines up, then you're ready to pull the trigger. Yeah, and that's, a, that's another principle that I think is um, key for successful people. And I... Like I've been reading business books and books about dental systems or different things like that over the last couple of years and studied a lot, even though I knew that it might be a year or two after dental school that until I'm actually able to apply these things. But the, the, the motivation came to me just because I knew that if I spent this time now, then when those situations present themselves in the future, I already have some background and I, and I can, I can make a decision quicker because of the time that I've already spent. So totally. yeah, I totally agree with that. And, and you're, when those situations present themselves where it would be useful to have a body of knowledge surrounding that thing, you often don't have time to go research and read books and talk to all these different people. Um, so you're never right. going to have time. There's never gonna be this magic, like, Oh, I have five weeks off and I'm really motivated to open all these books and read them all. You just kind of have to fit it in, whether that's podcasts or audiobooks or reading online, reading forums. For me, forums, Dentaltown, studentdoctor.net have always been my useful procrastination. So it's like I should be studying for this test, but instead I'm going to go <laughs> browse Dentaltown. And, yeah. and it's kind of useful, kind of not. But over time, you kind of get a, a, a bigger picture of, of maybe different ways you could do things. So, um, so you were looking at this practice and, you know, all these other practices were saying, no, timing's not going to work out, but then this one came along. Yeah. So, um, I basically just started pursuing it. Um, and when, uh, we just had to decide. And, if it, and uh, when I was mean, this, is this, you know, like, are you coming up on graduation and starting to sweat that you haven't found anything or when did you find this practice? Um, it was probably... Uh, I want to say it was probably January or February when I first saw it because, uh, we, my family, we drove down to Lufkin over my spring break, okay. which was like March 10th. So, I mean, I had, I knew enough about the practice to know that we wanted to go and visit and see if it was somewhere that we would like to live. Okay, cool. Um, so, so you still were a little ways out and you had some time to, to make this transition, make this deal happen. Uh, um, right. So then did you send a letter of intent or what, what was your next step? Yeah. Um, so I, there was a, let's see. So th there's a guy named Charles Loretto. He represents uh, Kane Waters and uh, he has his own company. It's called National Dental Placements and it's, uh, he helps people find practices. And so he came and he spoke to, us a couple of times at Creighton and I just really liked him. He was all about getting to ownership, um, about a year after graduation okay. and trying to motivate students and tell them the advantages of it. Do you so think I really, he, would, I, he would be willing to do a podcast? Do you think he, he'd be that kind of oh, guy? Oh yeah, I bet he would. Okay, cool. I bet he would. I'll get his contact yeah. info from you. Yeah, for sure. So, um, I had spoken to him about my plans and what I was looking for. And he said, uh, he said, let me know when you find things that uh, something that you want to pursue. And so I, I, uh, I had talked to him once before about a practice. And then I talked to him again about this practice. And, um, is he a so CPA ran... or is he a broker? Like what yeah. was he? He's a CPA. CPA. Okay. Yeah. So, and the, his, uh, his firm NDP is, is basically CPAs and they they are helping to do the initial evaluation, help you with your letter of intent, um, and walk you through the whole process up until uh, you, you close on the practice. So, and that letter so, of intent is like that initial offer. Like if you're trying to buy a house, you, through your realtor, you make an offer 
And then if they accept that, then you go into escrow and you negotiate. So it's kind of the same idea with, with buying a practice, right? You send a letter of intent with an initial offer and then they counter offer and you do your, your investigation, right? Exactly. Okay. And this will tell you how naive I was in this area. Um, when, I, when I found out about learning about how to go through this process and learning that the letter of intent was the next step, I mean, I read that it was non-binding and in my head I was just thinking, oh, well, this isn't really that big of a deal. It's just <laughs> like, you know, let's, let's make an offer. And yeah, see what see, just throw something against the wall, see if it sticks. <laughs> right. And, um, so, so what'd you talking, do? Talking with, um, NDP and Charles and, um, a couple of his, his, uh, associates that were helping me kind of helped realize, well, yes, it's not, it's not binding and, um, things could pen- potentially change evaluation or whatever, but this is a big deal because a lot of times this is, you know, this is the whole foundation for the contract and how things are going to be set up. So and how you're going to negotiate deserves, and and right. the the basic price that you're kind of arguing about. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So um yeah, they took a look at the practice, they did the evaluation, um told me um what what they thought about as far as what to offer and what things to change in the kind of the template of the letter of intent and um so we we submitted it. Uh, the the seller countered. What was your? Do you mind sharing the initial offer that you made? Or if if you ever don't want to tell me financials, that's totally fine. I'll I'll back off. But no, oh, that's I'm, fine. I'm no, nosy, so I want to know. Yeah, yeah. So he, the other thing that you have to understand is that the the appraisal was done for his practice a, a year previous. Okay. And. Okay. From what I understand, the selling doctor uh, went through, uh, had had a potential buyer, and the selling doctor got cold feet, didn't want to retire yet, so he pushed it off mm. another year. So the evaluation, the the appraisal and the asking price that I had was a year old. Okay. Their okay. their asking price was uh, four seventy four for the practice, and uh, they were also selling the building. And they were asking uh, 148 for the building. And what was the revenue on the practice? Um, it was about, it was 630. Okay, gotcha. Okay, cool. And, and then the following, the following year, the collections dropped about, about 50,000. So it was about, it was down to uh, 580. Gotcha. Um, so we ran the new numbers and, and NDP told me we'd be comfortable with something at about 380. Okay. Nice. So that's, that's what my letter of intent was. It was, uh, it was an offer for 380 and we modified some of the other things, but that's kind of the, the bulk of it. And um, do you think if you had just gone with a generic non-dental CPA or a, um, lawyer who wasn't familiar with dental practices and dental transitions that they would have had the knowledge to kind of counter offer that way? Um, I don't, I don't think so. I don't. And here's my opinion about hiring, um, attorneys and CPAs and people that are involved in the dental industry. From what I understand, people in those professions that specialize in the dental industry, they're not any more expensive than, uh, someone that's, uh, generic. So, it doesn't make much sense to me why you would hire someone that is not specifically in the dental industry. So everyone, my, my attorney and, uh, the, the CPAs, they're, they're, all they do is our dental deals. Right. So that was, well, and even if they sense. are a little bit more expensive, which, you know, I, I'm sure some of them are, are maybe a, a bit more, um, if they're saving you a hundred thousand dollars on your purchase price, exactly. It might, might be money well spent. Um, yeah, especially I feel like you, you can maybe get a little more granular once you've purchased the practice and decide, you know, I don't need a dental CPA doing my pay, payroll. I can do that online or whatever. But um, especially when you're doing a startup or doing an acquisition or a partnership, it blows my mind that like you wouldn't hire someone who's done dental practices over and over and over and over and over. And they they know what to look for. They know how to negotiate. They understand the tax write-offs and how to categorize everything. Um, because you just can't, 
it, it's not the same. And and dentistry is a little bit different than a pie shop or or a Starbucks or, you know, there are subtleties to it that they can bring their expertise to it. So that's really cool to hear that hiring the right people right up front saved you a lot of money right up front. Yeah, yeah, it did. Um, and so we made that initial offer of 380 and um, the the broker kind of, he called me and he said, he said the the seller, he said the seller's stuck on the 400 number. And so okay. we basically, we kind of went back to the drawing board a little bit and said, well, I'll do, we'll do 400 if the accounts receivable is included. Um, it looked like, it looked like the AR was usually around 25,000. So, okay. um, and that was, that was basically the, the next, that was my counter and nice. he accepted that. So that's awesome. Well, and out. it's awesome that you knew enough about what AR is and the fact that you can include that in negotiations to, to bring that up as an option of like, okay, you want that 400. Well, here's a way to bring it back down to 380 and everyone be okay with it. Yeah. Yeah. So that's awesome. Um, okay. So now you've got an accepted offer, you've done your due diligence, you graduate. What is that, you know, process between graduation and moving into your practice and what held you up, if anything? Um, man, it was a long process. I mean, I know it was, it was, so I was hoping, so, okay. So there's several, there are several things that are kind of rate limiting steps in this whole thing. There are several things. Uh, financing is, is one of the biggest ones. I mean, it's, it's pretty tough to find financing. Um, my, the broker representing the seller, uh, put me in touch with, uh, they're called Atlantic commercial and they, they help people. They're basically loan brokers. And so they, they package, they put everything, all my information together, they package it up and they send it out to potential lenders to try and get offers for loans. Okay. So um, instead of you having to do the footwork of calling a bazillion banks, they're doing that for you. Yes. Which I called a bazillion banks, but had, had pretty much everything fall through. So when, when the broker said he, he had, um, this this loan broker that could do things then that was that was awesome for me to hear right and, and it worked out um basically i i really didn't have any leverage my my financing is an sba loan so there's certain restrictions the rate is higher it's at six and three quarters which for um, for anyone unfamiliar with this an sba loan as i understand it and i could be wrong is a government loan set up for small businesses. So it's the small business administration and anyone starting a business can get one of these loans. There's a lot of paperwork surrounding it and it's a higher rate than if you had gone with a dental specific lender. Um, and usually people tell you to stay away from those because you can get a better deal with dental specific lenders. Is that kind of the advice that you'd get, you had gotten before? And am I explaining that correctly? Uh, yes. Other than it's not, it's not a loan from the government, but it's backed okay. by the government. Okay. So it's, um, banks that are approved by the SBA, the small business administration, they can give out loans and have, um, have it backed. I think it's like up to like 85%. Okay. Um, so that's, yeah, that's, that's essentially how it works. Things it's, you, yeah, the way that you explained it is, is right. Okay. So it's like, oh, this isn't ideal. Like, I don't want an SBA loan. I want a loan from, you know, Bank of America or Wells Fargo, their dental sure. divisions. Um, but why did you decide, okay, let's do this. Let's do the SBA loan. Um, it really wasn't, I don't know. It sh maybe it should have been a harder decision for me, but I was just determined to get to ownership quickly. And if I had to go through this route, the potential upsides of getting the ownership immediately were higher than, um, you know, the, the interest. So that I'd be it, paying. it was what you had to do to get the deal done. So you did it. Exactly. Um, yeah. can you refinance that down the road? Do you know? Yes, there's no prepayment penalties. So I can, I can essentially refinance at any point that I'm able to. Okay, so cool. it's, it don't, it really affects me for the first couple of years. Okay, cool. Uh, awesome. Um, so, um, so lending is possible. It's just difficult and you might have to take a less than ideal deal. 
yeah, jumping through financing. There's a lot of things to fill out, a lot of paperwork. Um, staying on top of that is important. Right. There's appraisals that have to be done by the bank. Um, I purchased the building, so there's a survey. There's a, the real estate contract. Um, so these these are several things that held up the deal at different points. And it, it's um, always going to take longer than you think, even though everything is supposed to be lining up. It never does. You know, with something this big, there's just so many moving parts and so many ways that miscommunication or small errors or just delays because it takes them that long to get out and survey the building or, or you know. Exactly. So just yep. plan on, have, have a plan and then, you know, double it, maybe double it again. And that's probably how long it's going to take. <laughs> yeah. So the other, the other very frustrating part of this process was getting my license through Texas. Mm. Um, I initially called the board to find out the best way to do things and how long it would take. The person on the phone said, well, we tell people two to four weeks, but it's usually one to three. <laughs> and so I, uh, I set a date to close three weeks after um, I graduated because that's when my final paperwork would be done. So right. um, I Makes should sure have my license by three weeks if she says it's usually one to three. Why would she say so, anything different? Yeah. Right. <laughs> so I had a closing date of June 15th. Okay. And um, the date came came and went. Uh, I didn't have a license. I was, I was, I, I called the board um, once once or twice a day to try and check. <laughs> so on... did they know you by first name at that point? They're like, Oh, Derek's calling again. Well, <laughs> they should have. Right. I don't know. I think, I think they were probably getting a lot of calls from a lot of different people. No, I actually, I have two buddies. I'm my next door neighbor that just moved in. He's another army dentist who was trying to get his Texas license and another friend from Midwestern, uh, in my area. He has been trying to get his Texas license and they've all been, calling and frustrated and can't practice and they have to shadow the oral surgeon because there's nothing for them and they're not even allowed to administer local anesthesia or take out any yeah. teeth they're, they're basically right. assisting um, right and everyone's banging their head against the wall so and and you i think i remember you reading one of your posts that you even um you even tried to submit stuff early like you tried in dental school to submit everything but your uh, diploma is that correct or am i getting you mixed up with someone else no, yeah, yeah, that's correct. So I submitted everything that I could early, so that then when I, then when I sent my uh, diploma, then it would be complete and they could they could process it. Well, that's a good thing in some states. I, I mean, I guess depend on how they how they run the show. Sure. But in Texas, that was a bad thing because they they got my diploma or something else, and they said, well. All we have is a diploma. Why is it? <laughs> so let's just, we'll file it away. Let's sit on so, this. Yeah. So there was several weeks that went by that all my stuff was in. So you had I, your diploma in one file in the filing uh -huh. cabinet. And then you also had your, all of your other paperwork. They were probably right next to each other. Like alphabetically, uh -huh. they probably like filed this Derek Williams. Oh, that's kind of funny. There's another Derek Williams right here. Let, let, we'll just put these next uh -huh. to each other. So your paperwork is all sitting there literally probably next to each other and you're nothing's getting done because they they're waiting on everything right oh, right that's frustrating um unfortunately the, the way that they communicated was through um just post mail and <laughs> i had moved i right. tried to set up my new address um through the board but no one responded to that so my address was never changed um, and there was some complications with my forwarding address, so that didn't work out. Of course. So um, finally, one day, yeah, it was when we were moving to Texas. Okay. And we were on the road, and I tried to call again, and someone answered. And mm. I couldn't believe it. I said, I said, hi, this is Derek Williams. And I, I just expected them to know who I was because I'd left so many messages. Right. And, well, they didn't listen um, to any of them. That's the problem. Right, right. Anyway, I, I told them what the situation was, and she said, she said, well, on my record, it shows that we sent you a letter two weeks ago that your application was incomplete. And I explained to her that my address, no one had updated my address, and so I, I didn't receive it. I said, everything has been submitted. Let me know what you're missing, and I'll tell you the date that it was submitted. Right. So she let me know. I pulled over on the freeway, and I, I looked it up on my phone. I told her the dates, 
and she told me that she would look into it and call me in the afternoon. Of course, she didn't call me back, but someone else called me back um, two days later and said, good, just want to let you know your license has been processed. So we'll, we'll send you something in the mail so that you can activate your license. And I said, well, my address is still not been updated. <laughs> can you just change my address? She said, no, you'll have to go online to do that. Uh, oh, have you ever so, seen the, have you ever heard that Brian Regan's skit where he's like moving in and trying to call the power company and be like, can you, can you turn on my power? And they're like, oh yeah, we've got you scheduled for next Thursday. Well, is it just like a, a switch you just have to flip? It's like, yeah, but we're going to switch it on Thursday. It's like, well, can I, can I come switch it? Like, can, I'll just hold the letter. I'll come and, and pick it up myself or, or change the address or put white out. You're like, ah, sorry. Right. I feel your pain. Right. Yeah. Long story short, it eventually got processed and um, it ended up working out. Our closing date turned out to be July 22nd. So okay. it was... It was a little over a month after what I initially planned, but um, oh, and what yeah. were you doing in that month between when you thought you were going to be a practicing dentist and when you actually started practicing? Okay, before we move on, a quick word from our sponsor, Q Optics. In the last episode, I mentioned that I had upgraded my loops from from three point five to four point five while I was still in dental school, and and when I did that, my neck started hurting. And I was so frustrated because I loved that 4.5 magnification. First, I thought, oh, it's the angle of declination, or maybe it's the weight because it's a bulkier frame and heavier loops, and maybe that's what it is. I realized that the reason my neck hurt all the time was how much I had to bend down to look over my loops. And so if if you look at yourself in the mirror, this this is what I, I want you to do. I want you to stand in front of the mirror with your loops on and look at your eyes looking straight forward. If the the loops, if the telescopes are blocking your eyeballs, that means anytime you look at something that's not through the loops, you have to crane your head down to to look at it. You are hurting your neck. It, it blows my mind. Why why can't you make a frame that's taller, that's that reaches down further? And if you look at the cover of, of the, the podcast, you can see that Q Optics has designed their own frame that dips down to make room for the optics to go below your eye level. So I can put on my loops and I can actually look in the mirror and see clearly my eyeballs completely over the level of the telescopes. If you find that your neck's hurting or that your back is starting to hunch, maybe it's not necessarily the angle of declination or the weight. Maybe it's the fact that there isn't enough room in the lenses to see over your loops. So if you're ready to make the upgrade to better ergonomics, you can email sales at qoptics.com. That's q-optics.com with the promo code SP16 for $100 off your next pair of loops or $300 off your next loops and light combo. Q Optics, it's time to have a better look. Um, so we moved, we moved here, uh, three weeks early. We, this is, I don't know, this is going to maybe sound even more crazy, but we, we ended up buying a house. So we were able to get, um, a mortgage. And so during those few weeks I was helping paint the house and get everything unpacked. And well, at least you bought the house after you bought the practice and not the other way around. Cause sometimes then if the practice doesn't go through now, you're stuck with a house and no practice. And now your geography is that much more limited. So no, that is what happened. What? Oh, cause you couldn't close. <laughs> right. Oh right. man, so you're doing it never, all wrong. We ne- I know we never planned that. I mean, the plan was to close on the practice first and then and then because i didn't think the bank would let us i didn't think the bank would give us a mortgage without because it was all based on the practice financials right because you're, you're, i didn't have any work history theoretical so. income well exactly w- did you get one of those doctor loans because i feel like ironically um before you graduate and before you start working as a practicing dentist they can give you like these doctor loans based on your projected income. But then once you start practicing and you're self-employed, now they treat you as a self-employed person and they want two years of work history self-employed. Exactly. Um, so is that why you ended up buying right out of the gate? Um, well, 
I, so I talked to a few people in those, you know, they said, yeah, we have programs for doctors and dentists. And as soon as I told them, well, I'm purchasing a practice, they said, oh, well, if you have no contract or guaranteed salary, then we can't do anything for you. So gotcha. yeah, essentially come back after two years. And I talked to a guy, my, our realtor for our house set me up with her banker. And he, he said, we have a lot of history with, with doctors and it just allows us to be more aggressive with our, our funding lending. lending. Yeah. And so he said, we're, we're willing to do this. And he said, he said, this is how much we'll, we're be willing to, to lend you for a house. And so we started looking and the, the plan the whole time along was to close on the house after the practice. Right. Um, but then with how much things were delayed and just kind of a desire to get settled in the area before then they, they told us it was an option and I, I, I thought it was crazy, but I felt good about it. You so we plunge. just went ahead and did it. Well, if you're moving to Lufkin, Texas, which is like 40,000, right? Not a big place. Right. You're, it, it sounds like you're in it for at least the medium haul. And yeah. you bought the, the practice was in the works and you took a risk and, and it worked out. So yeah, it is what it yeah. is. That's awesome. Yeah. So, okay. So you, you moved in, got settled. Um, did you hang around the, the practice at all during that month? Yeah. So I would go in and, uh, talk to the staff. I mean, obviously we're trying to, uh, keep everything, uh, confidential. And so I, I wasn't there when there was patients there, but okay. I'd, I'd go in and talk with the staff and, um, talk with the, the, the dentist about different things. Um, any, any like, did did he so he couldn't introduce you to patients he could introduce introduce you to the staff and talk with them was that awkward at all or was there like this tension of like you're gonna be my new boss and how's that gonna work out or how how did you feel about all that and did you feel so, like i'm i'm straight out of school i know nothing how am i gonna lead these people and are they gonna take me seriously or is that just <laughs> something in my head no that was definitely a concern um so Immediately after graduation, um, I drove a moving truck and moved all of our stuff down to Lufkin and put it in a storage unit. Okay. Uh, and then and then we spent the next month or so visiting with family. Um, so when I came down and I brought all that stuff, we had set up for me to come in and, and meet the staff. Okay, cool. So the doctor announced to his staff like the day before that he was selling his practice. Oh, and wow. Said that, I was going to come in and meet him the next day. Um, so I was, yeah, I was, I was super nervous. I was, How can I you was not really be? scared. Yeah. Somehow I have, I, I'm pretty good at faking it until you make it. Sure. So I can, I can put on a big smile and I can act confident for, for a while. Right. And that's, that's what I did. I took, I bought some gift cards and cards and showed up and, um, we, uh, I bought lunch for the staff, I think. Cool. Oh wait, no, I didn't. No. But I gave him gift cards and just went and met him. And it was, uh, th they were very nice, but it was, it was intimidating. They had printed out a sheet of about, I don't know, 10 or 15 questions asking, you know, are you going to change this? This oh, is boy. how he does it. Are you going to do this? Before, so, before it, it hasn't even closed yet. And they're already like, no, they're already asking you, can we have, uh -huh. ha have extra days off? what yeah. were they asking you like what was it that they wanted to change or they they didn't want to change uh they said well he pays for our scrubs are you gonna pay for our scrubs he pays for our <laughs> certification we get this much pay uh this we get um this much vacation time we get um we go out for lunch on our birthdays and wow uh the our dentist does he gives really good injections do you know how to <laughs> give good injections oh that's great so, so so what do you say to all this i mean do you do you cuz there's this balance of do you make promises and say yes or do you hold off or do you say no you know like and then if you I, what a what a high pressure first meeting like i know oh and you yeah. don't have any control yet and then they can go back and like talk about it and scheme for a month while the practice closes and then oh man so what'd you say what'd you how'd it go um most questions i basically said i said i'm gonna i'm gonna try and keep things 
as uh, running the same as much as we can. There's def I'm there's definitely going to be changes that I want to make, but I realize that this is it's going to be a big transition for you all and it's it's a big transition for me. Okay. So um I will try and stay as close to how things have been done, but I'm sure there will be changes as awesome. time goes along. Perfect. Oh, that's that's I'm going to I'm going to use that line. So that, that that that's good stuff there. So, okay, cool. So, you met them. How many um total staff? How many team members uh were there? Uh one front desk, okay. um two assistants and a hygienist. Okay. So not huge, but still, this is a team of four people that depend on you for their living and yeah. they're worried about stuff and you want to have a good relationship with them and so then that was when you first drove all your stuff out. Then you go visit family for a month. Now you're back waiting for things to close, um, going in, kind of meeting them, getting to know them. What are your thoughts like leading up to opening day or not opening day, but, you know, that that transition date? And how are you feeling? What is it that's that's keeping you up at night before getting into the practice? I mean, most of the time I was focused on things that needed to be done. So uh, documents or appraisals or survey, stuff like that. Um, I wasn't, I, I was, I was pretty pleased with the staff and the, le- the things that I learned about them. Okay. They seemed, um, like they were trying to be, I mean, as t- intimidating as those questions sound, they were, they were still asking me questions like, is this how you want to do it? We can change this if you want to. Cool. So they, okay. you know, they, they did, they did kind of have a flexible attitude at the same time. Right. Um, so that, that put me at ease, but I mean, so I, I wasn't really too nervous. I was nervous about meeting the patients. Okay. I was nervous about, are they, are they going to like me? Are they, um, what is the staff going to like me? I right. sure hope they like me so that they can be honest with the patients and just say, you know, you're going to like Dr. Williams. We really like him here. So, right. Um, those, that was probably the main thing that was concerning to me is, um, just having a smooth transition. Okay. Before you, you got into that transition, were you worried about your clinical skills and your hand speed and, and procedures at all? Or did you feel either naively confident from dental school and you, you thought you were going to be good or actually confident because you were pretty good in dental school. Uh, <laughs> a little bit of both. I, yeah, I was, I was definitely, um, yeah, I, I mean, somewhere in between confident and naively confident. Okay. Because I mean, I felt like I was never very good at tests and scoring super well. But when we got into the clinic in dental school, I just felt like I was alive and I loved doing procedures and and working and stuff. Um, I I underestimated the efficiency and uh, just that importance and the ability to do hygiene checks throughout the day and things like that. Okay. Um, Well, so let's let's dive into it then. So your first week, um, you know, like how many patients were you seeing a day? And what were the things that you expected versus what actually happened um, in in that first week of both practice ownership and as a new dentist fresh out of school? Um, So uh, the way that they had been doing things, um, they they have three columns on their scheduling. And they basically have the hygienist seeing a patient uh, on average 30 to 45 minutes. Um, okay. and then they had the previous doctor seeing a patient every 30 minutes. And so it, I don't know, it, it seemed like it didn't really matter what the procedure was. So it definitely wasn't like provider time scheduling. Hmm. It was just, you have a patient call, put them in the schedule. If there's a slot, 30 minute slots um, for the provider for everything. Right. Ooh, right. Okay. Um, so I, I said, let's go to our hour long slots. Yeah. No, that's Um, as a new dentist, I was definitely taking an hour on every filling. Yeah. That's kind of how we, how we started out and that's how we've been going so far for the two weeks. So when you count on the schedule, there's usually about, um, 20 patients a day, probably, uh, four in the morning for me, four in the afternoon for me, and then 12, 12 hygiene patients. Um, and and that's, what was more stressful, the hygiene checks or the operative? Um, or just jumping back little, and forth? 
A little bit of both. Um, interestingly, I didn't really expect that, but there was there was just things that came up that I I wasn't I didn't I didn't know necessarily how to approach. So, uh, for example, I mean, all the operative was fairly simple, but there there was things that I was that had been planned or that I was seeing come in that I had never seen before. Like, for example, um, I've seen several people where the, the previous doc had basically done, okay, so for example, like number two would be an MO, uh-huh. uh, three would be MOD, okay. and number four would be a DO, and it's all just one blob of composite that's all cured together, so it's acting as as like it's splinting those there's no contact together. they're all um so they're all there's there's yeah, no there's oh my. It's, it's all one unit it's of, like a of bridge composite. of composite yeah on but they're all i mean they're all teeth with roots on them so it's not necessarily a bridge but <laughs> it's, so it's, it's like a splint of composite across the top and that's so, great maybe that's some technique that i don't know about but like that would feel very weird for me to to walk in and either see that in someone's mouth or like have that planned on my schedule. I'd be like, uh, exactly. What do I do? Exactly. With this? Yeah. So there's been several times when a patient will come in and say, um, well, my, my splint broke and they call it a splint. <laughs> okay. Staff calls it a splint. splint. And so they, it said on the schedule, it said there's a, there's a, a splint that needs to be repaired. And so I was just thinking it was like a night guard or something like that. Right. And, they come in, they're like, yeah, it's back here. And so I look in the mouth and I'm like, oh, wow. So um, oh. things like th- that. How, um, did, how, and did, then with, how did he build that? Do you know? I think he basically just built it as like surfaces of composite. So just uh, two MO, three, M- three MOD, four DO. See, with that new study that just came out, you know, we're, we're recording this August 6th and like three days ago that that Associated Press flossing is no longer recommended right. uh thing that's perfect now you don't need to floss yeah. so i just put yeah. a big log of composite between three teeth you can bill it you don't have to mess with contacts or matrix bands this is brilliant i'm i'm gonna go on the lecture circuit with with this new technique i love it <laughs> uh, sorry i don't want to so, make fun of the, the previous dentist he's he's got a technique he's got what worked for him you're doing something different and that's that's always going to be the case when you walk into a practice is there's going to be right. things that you just disagree with how they did dentistry because you've been trained a different way he was trained one exactly. way and and that like tricky balance of respecting his work and respecting um you know what was treatment planned and what the staff is used to doing um but creating a new standard and a new way of doing things that and, and being put on the spot with with expectations like that that can be dicey yeah yeah very much so and so, and okay, so here's one thing about the, the selling doc is that he would do those procedures. And a lot of times he's trying to just help patients help their teeth last a few more years longer. Or, so it's you like know, it's a little never, bit of herodontics of, of like, right, let's just patch this up and it'll get you a few more years. And then, you know, eventually it's going to have to come out. This isn't like a long term. He's not like putting fancy crowns on these or bridges or, or right. complex prosthetics that he's, he's just kind of patching. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and, and a lot of the patients loved him for it and which, I mean, I don't blame him. He found, he found an affordable solution for them to get by a little bit longer. Right. Um, anyway, so there's an example and then other things like just people wanting things that I wasn't aware of or like having certain, um, having a white patch under the tongue and trying to decide what to do. What'd you do? Um, I, I, uh, I basically said, come back in two weeks, we'll okay. check it again. And if we, if we, if we need to, we can send you to the oral surgeon. You can yeah. Biopsy. If it's still there in two weeks, that's definitely one to kind of act a little bit scared about so that the patient yep. actually goes and sees the oral surgeon, which you knew, but that's still right. s- scary to see that. And you're like, Oh, this could be really bad. We need to address that but not yeah. knowing because it's like your first time you've ever seen a white patch under yeah. the tongue. And, right. and, oh, okay, cool. Well, no, you, yeah. you, you did the right thing. Um, uh, I've seen two, two hairy tongues of people concerned about what to do. Okay. Um, and then a, a woman that wanted internal bleaching in which I've read about it, but I haven't done it right. that before. So things, 
things like that. Those are examples of things like in hygiene checks that are coming up that, and sometimes they ask a question and I don't know exactly what to do. Um, I saw a, uh, a kid and we've been taking panos to just monitor things. And, and one of them, I just said, you know what, let me just take a little bit more time to, to study this and I'll call you back later. And so um, p- patients are usually fairly understanding with things like that. So right. that's, that's been fine. Has, um, has your speed of exams been an issue? Like in, in dental school, an exam could be like a hour to two hour block, you know, cause we had to do comprehensive right. exams and all of that. Um, and, and, uh, it could be hard to then have 10 to 12 to, you know, whatever number of patients per day that you have to do exams on. And you can't take an hour like you did in dental school. You've got to look at the teeth, right. look at the gingiva, look for anything else and, and move on. Has that been hard at all transitioning to faster exams? Um, not, not as difficult as I would have thought it would. Okay. Um, usually, usually there's, uh, not too many problems going on. Um, and usually the hygienist is good to point things out to me. Cool. So you've got Um, them on your team that way. Yeah. Yeah. And I've told her that I said, don't be afraid to, to tell the patient that you're suspicious about this and, and I'll, and then let me know when I walk in and I'll always address it. I'll, I won't say things like, oh, I'm not sure what Rhonda was seeing here. It looks fine to me. I'm not gonna gonna throw you under the bus. Right, right. And she's been very receptive and and very good about uh, doing things like that. So that's that's made things nice. So um the the thing with exams that's more difficult is acting like I have all the time in the world to sit down and to talk to this new new patient that's been this previous doc for 30 years and now there's this new guy come in. So whenever I walk in the room, I just have as big of a smile as I can on my sure. face and I say, hello, how are you today? And um, I just sit down and I face them. I cross my legs and just act like I got plenty of time to talk to them. <laughs> Even I though you're super don't. stressed about this, you know, right. three, three unit uh, composite bridge that you don't know what to do with in the other room. <laughs> and, and yeah, okay. Yeah. So I act like I have all the time in the world. And even though I probably only spend um, five minutes in the room, I spend probably the first two minutes just um, trying to be really friendly and show that I, I care. I'm really glad, glad that they came to the practice. Awesome. Um, And then just spend the rest of the time on, on the exam. Um, I hooked up a tablet with an intraoral camera to be able to show things to people. And that's been very helpful. Cool. Um, I think, um, I think that's especially critical, like co-diagnosis, that idea of capturing on photo or, or, you know, through DSLR or intraoral camera, whatever it is, and then allowing the patient to see what you see. That's always important, but especially when you're the new dentist coming in and the old dentist hasn't been talking about any of these issues that you're talking about um, right. and, and isn't seeing the problems that you're seeing um, where you're recommending a crown and he was recommending, uh, you know, a four surface compositor or whatever it was. Um, sure. And so to have the patients have that in their hands and they can see, oh, what's wrong with this tooth? Like, ugh, let's fix this. Uh-huh. Um, that's awesome that you knew right up front. And I'm sure that's from all of your dental town and CE and reading and all of that that you, you picked up on that. Um, it's cool to hear that it really probably wasn't that expensive to get a little intraoral camera and a tablet, right? Yeah, I got, I got, uh, a camera for 150 bucks and then I got a tablet for a hundred bucks. So total setup is 250. Probably paid for um, itself. Like the second time you used it. Oh yeah, for sure. And the other cool thing is that the staff just love it. They love seeing pictures and they, and, and they're seeing things from my perspective now right i'm able to explain see the way that this tooth is see this crack and where it's going and when i when i see people that come in and they've got a broken tooth this is what it used to look like right um so the staff the staff have really liked it it's been very good to explain things with the patients and whenever i present treatment i i tell them i say my goal as the dentist is to inform you what's going on and let's let you know the risks and let you make a decide a decision as far as what to, what you want to do 
as far as treatment. Awesome. I'm just, I mean, it's your mouth, it's your teeth. I don't really care what you do, but I just want you to know. So that's, that's my job. And, and patients have been really receptive to that. I think they, they like to hear that they're, they're the one making the decision. I'm not pressuring them, but I'm, I'm letting them know what's going on, letting them make a choice. No. And I love that. Cause like, I can literally hear phrases of what you're saying that I've heard in different podcasts with Gary Takis and Dr. Leanne Brady and Howard Fran. And I'm sure you've heard it all these different places, but, um, this, this idea of no cell dentistry and of passing the ownership back to them through photos and co-diagnosis, um, that's like, that's ideal in my mind because you don't feel, no one gets that icky feeling of being pressured into doing something that they shouldn't be doing. Instead, right. they see the problems, they own the problems, and hopefully they, they choose to accept treatment. And the fact that you're saying it's in, the ball is in your court, here's the problem, they're then looking for solutions rather than you need a filling. And they're like, well, I don't feel any pain. So right. that's sweet. So, okay. So you've been doing a lot of things right. And it sounds like you've had a lot of education leading up to this that's allowed you to, to step in. What have been the things that weren't what you expected them to be or that have stressed you out these past two weeks or that have kept you up at night? And what are kind of some of the lower moments over the first two weeks of, of practice ownership? Yeah. Um, this is going to sound silly, but just crown preps. Okay. Um, I, I mean, in dental school, you have so long and you have different ways to check reduction and different things. And um, there've been a couple times when I've prepped a tooth and uh, then, and here's the other thing is my assistants, the, the previous doc did almost everything himself. I mean, he put in, he loaded his own syringes, put on the needles, he set um, they basically just had things out in different packages and he would open it up and uh, get things ready. Mm. So, um, and the same for temporaries, uh, he's always made his own. So the, the assistants uh, haven't really known how to make them. And so that's been part of it where it just takes, takes me longer. And then, and then I've made the temporaries and I thought for sure I had enough reduction. Right. And now I'm grinding a hole right through, right through the provisional. So, um, and then, yep. um, just, uh, trying to keep the patient comfortable during the procedure, trying to act confident and, and cool the whole time, even when things get stressful. Right. Um, there's, I, I haven't had any patients that have been upset about anything, but just having, ha going through an appointment where someone doesn't uh, isn't, doesn't seem happy and right. seems kind of irritated. Well, there's been, they're at the dentist and they're paying and they're not as patient with you because you're not coming to a dental school. Right. Exactly. And that's been, that's been a harder transition than I expected in dental school. I kind of had the attitude, you know, if a patient was upset with me, I basically told him, um, I'm doing the best I can. If, if you don't feel like I'm meeting your needs, you are at a dental school and you're more than welcome to, to go to a private practice. Right. And some, you've got that out. That yeah. And so it was, I felt basically no responsibility <laughs> in dental school. I was really good at um, shifting that back to the patient. Right. And now it's, I feel very responsible for the comfort of the patient and, and what their, their experience is like their experience. in the office. Yeah. yeah. And so, when things have kept me up at night, it's been things, it's been things like that. Okay. And, and that's so hard. Like, I think there's this, this balance between empathy and caring for patients and also realizing you can't make everyone happy and they're, they're going to be in pain and they're going to be frustrated and they're going to have to pay for things. And so it's so hard. And I struggle with this. Like when I, when I do an exam on a patient, even in the army where they don't have to pay for everything or anything. And, and I, I just tell them what they need and then they have to get it done in order to be green in the system. Um, it's still in my mind, harder to tell someone they need a whole lot of work when they're obviously not happy and hate the dentist. And they've told me as much, um, in the exam and you want to make them happy and, but you have to tell them what's wrong and you have to get them through the procedure and it, it's hard to get them numb and all these things. When you're doing everything you can and they're still not happy and they're still in pain and and you're you feel like it's your fault because you're the new doc or you yeah. know, maybe you could have done it better or 
maybe it's taking longer because you are slower. Um, that's hard. That's like one of those things that I, I still struggle with. And the, the, the flip side is to be the, the sociopath that never cares about the patient and only cares right. about getting the work done and can be a robot with, with everything. And, and I don't think that works. Um, it can work to some degree in, in some situation, but for me and for what I like, um, like I, we all got into dentistry because we want to help people. Um, and then to not have that go perfectly and have to, I don't know, just try and keep people happy that aren't happy is it wears on you. Yeah, exactly. How, how have you, uh, been coping with that? I mean, there is, you can't really in two weeks, you just kind of, you kind of deal with it, but has that, has that kept you up at all or bothered you kind of outside the, the practice? Uh, yeah, it's been, uh, and not, not just, I mean, so everything adds up and then being, I mean, it's, it's a transition period. There's a lot of things, still a lot of paperwork and, uh, transitioning things over into my name, uh, getting, getting payroll set up, getting, um, accounting stuff. So there's just, I mean, it, every day there's just a big to-do list besides seeing the patients sure. and taking care of them. And, um, it's been, it's been extremely overwhelming. The first, the first week was, was really hard. I mean, there's a lot of things that are going very well, right? but just the, the, the amazing, um, amount of things that have been overwhelming. I came home on, so we're open Monday through Thursday and okay. I've worked, um, on Friday mornings just with a couple bigger cases that we've had, but, um, I, the first week I came home on, on Thursday and I just went in my bedroom and I just cried. <laughs> I, was, I was just feeling uh. so overwhelmed and responsible for everything. And I'm usually a person that manages stress very well. And I feel responsible for what I need to, but I, but I, but I don't for, for things that I can't control, but there's so much that is under my control that it's been, it's been very overwhelming. No, um, I'm and I'm the type that uh, if I'm sleep deprived and then I watch a, a, a sappy Disney movie, it'll get to me. But if I'm not sleep deprived, <laughs> I can usually, you know, keep it together. But uh, <laughs> I, I can imagine all of the stress, all the pressure, all the things that still need to be done and being slow and learning how to how to do these things and, and, and please these patients that are hard to please um, and don't want to be pleased because they're paying money and they're still in pain. Um that that's amazing that you've you've kept it together and that you have so much knowledge that's allowed your transition to go so smoothly. Um, I I have really really appreciated your your honesty and your candor, kind of with your whole transition, your whole experience. Um, what is it that out of everything that you expected and thought that is is the most different actually doing it versus what you thought it was going to be like? Um, and if you don't have a good answer, we'll just edit this bit out. That's fine. N no, uh, I think, I think one thing that I expected, I expected to know exactly which would be the more, most important changes and how to implement them. Um, uh, that probably sounds super naive that I'm, you know, I'm coming out of dental school and I expected to have that experience. I know I can recognize when things go wrong. And I know that we can make changes, but we're in a time period where we can't just change everything. We have to focus on the most important things. So how how do I choose the most important things and put my energy into those rather than being spread so thin on making a lot of different changes? Uh, that's That's been something that I expected to come easier and um, it it hasn't. It's getting It's getting there and I'm getting a more um, narrow vision and understanding what to do. But, uh, that, that was, that was somewhat unexpected for me. Well, and I think you came to the table with a fair amount of understanding and knowledge, having done, you know, Scott Luna's breakaway for a week and, and all these other things that you've done and, and things on dental town. Um, I think universally we underestimate how much time things will take and how much time we actually have and our resources and our energy to do those things. And so 
to to realize I need to change all these things and then have to decide, okay, where do I start and what do I focus on? What is the most important? Like there, there's no way to actually know that right up front. And so you're going to have, right. and, and you know this, you're just making uh, your best call and moving forward with that and, and getting as far as you can with that. And then if, if it's not ideal, you'll revisit it later and move on to the next thing. That, that's, that's the reason that it's scary. The reason that it's hard. And it's the reason that people don't want to do that is because now there's this whole set of decisions that you make as the practice owner that impact everything. And if you don't make those decisions and build it purposefully and build systems around things, it doesn't happen. It just kind of continues the way it's been. So I'm excited to follow you on your journey. If you're willing to to kind of come back and let me interview you again, um, I would love to talk a little bit more about kind of the the pre-work and the, the dental school stuff and the education that you got beforehand. And then also to kind of hear over time things that you try and implement and how they went and how they, what you thought it would work well and then it didn't. Um, I would love to follow your journey if, if you don't mind. Yeah, that sounds great. This has been a lot of fun. I know you're, my wife is probably somewhere in the house waiting for me to be done with my podcast and yours is probably doing the same thing. Uh, <laughs> so thank you for sharing some of your, your Saturday morning with me. And, and I, I look forward to, to talking to you soon. Thanks Richard. Appreciate it. Awesome. Hey, take care. Okay. okay real quick. One of the reasons I decided to leave it at an hour and a half is a, is a buddy got mad at me because he was like, hey, I want the second half of the Dr. Luna interview. Why, why'd, you, why'd you go and cut it in half? So instead of cutting this in half, I just gave you more. I mean, it's a podcast. You could stop it whenever you want and continue listening to it later if it's too long. It doesn't need to fit in a certain slot. But once again, looking for feedback. If anyone has strong opinions either way, I'll, I'll take that into consideration. Real quick, if you want the spreadsheet that was mentioned by Derek that George Hariri created. Uh, George has been gracious enough to upload that and uh, you can download that. There'll be a link in the the show notes in the description here. Um, Same thing if you want to see the overview of this podcast, the eight season roadmap, we'll have a link to that as well. And then lastly, the the camera and tablet combination will be in the show notes as well if you're interested in in the exact camera and tablet that Derek used in his practice. So Another big thanks to New Villager for letting me use their music. And we will see you tomorrow on the Shared Practices Podcast, Episode 3.